You are listening to the Embrace What Matters podcast. My name is John Mahalik. I'm a seminary-trained author and speaker with over 25 years' experience encouraging others in the areas of spiritual life change and authentic relationship. My goal is to bridge the things of eternity with everyday experience. The current episodes in this podcast are sermons that I delivered while pastoring a church in the country of Honduras. If this podcast encourages you and helps you, can I ask that you please write a review and leave a rating? It will simply help more people find the podcast who may, like you, be searching for more purpose and meaning. Thanks again for listening and enjoy this week's episode. We are in a series uh, here at Union called Belonging to Him. Uh, The series, uh, for those of you who haven't been here, is uh, about what it says, belonging to God. What does that mean for my life? How does that transform me? Uh, How does that relate to how I relate to other people? It's based on the premise that uh, the deepest need of the human heart is personal relationship. And so how does that uh, shape the way I think about God, the way I belong to God? But specifically, how do I uh, use that mindset in approaching Scripture? A lot of us in the room have spent years studying Scripture, learning about Scripture. Uh, we know it backwards and forwards. We can, we can dictate the basic doctrines of salvation and the gospel. Um, but sometimes I think we get away with attaching theology and Scripture with relationship. We, we speak about either one, maybe in isolation, uh, but we don't speak about them together, and we can't necessarily speak about relationship from a scriptural standpoint. So the idea behind this series, one of the ideas is, is looking at the gospel and the salvation story from the standpoint of relationship. It's not to the exclusion of all the other things that you've learned in scripture, uh, but it is really kind of just emphasizing how can we think about the scripture relationally, how can we think about uh, the way we speak about God to other people uh, relationally and scripturally? So uh, we have been uh, dealing with the area of need these last uh, many weeks. We started out with our need for loving relationship. Uh, and now the, these, these few weeks we've been looking at our need for true relationship. Uh, we're, we're getting into that. Last week we kind of had a transition of love and truth. We, we talked about the idea of true love. What does true love uh, mean to us scripturally? Not just the romantic idea of true love, but how is God's love true to us? Uh, we looked at things like house rules and the, the boundaries that we place on our lives and our family environment that are loving. Those are rules, those are truths that we, we put into our lives that are loving. Uh, So now we're going to focus more on the idea of truth itself this morning. What makes our relationship with God, our relationship with others, true? What makes our relationship true? True relationship. So to do that, I want to talk about a story that you've heard, one we focus on usually during the Easter season, of Jesus standing before Pilate. He's been arrested uh, he's been beaten. He stood before the San- Sanhedrin. And now he's standing before the Roman governor, Pilate. So I'll read the narrative here. It says, who was this man? So this is kind of my paraphrase a little bit of John 19. Pontius Pilate stared at him. He was brought to him bound, disheveled, freshly bruised from some recent beating. Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replies, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. So you are a king. Jesus says, You say correctly that I'm a king. For this I have been born. And for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth... Here's my voice. And Pilate's reply is, what is truth? What is truth? Which is a very profound statement whether Pilate 
knew it at the time or not. For Pilate, there would be no answer. Jesus does not answer him. There was no need to answer because truth was staring at him right in the face. He was looking at truth. So why would Jesus have to answer the question, what is truth? Here it is, right here. We'll develop that in a second. Fake news. <laughs> the, I struggle being relatively new to Honduras that I still uh, will spend a lot of time on U.S. websites and, and focusing on U.S. culture, and I know a lot of people in the room either are from the U.S. or have a familiarity with the U.S., but the last few years, we've been hearing this phrase, this term, fake news. And one of the things I, I, th I find funny about it is um, usually, you know, at least from a political perspective, both the, the left side of politics and the right side of politics uh, feel like they have ownership over this term, <laughs> meaning the other side is the, is the one that has the fake news. <laughs> and you can see that if you, if you read uh, political commentary or, or headlines, that the other side is deceiving you. The other side is, is giving you fake news, and we're the ones with the truth. So that's a term that we've been dealing with a lot lately. But beyond even the last few years, the idea, what is truth, is, is something that exists predominantly in our culture. It's something that, that n none of us really feel like we have a handle on. The idea of truth is elusive, that meaning most of us are biased. Most of us cannot get to a place of, of objective truth because it's all coming from through our filter. That, that, that there's no way to really say this is what the truth is because it's my truth. And, and also we talk about moral relativism, right? Truth is relative to me and my experience, my culture, my motivation. So truth is not something that you and I can really get a handle on. It's not something that we can really arrive at. The best that we can do is to say, this is my truth, and that's your truth. And, and if you were to tell me that there's some overarching truth somewhere that both of us have to adhere to, you're probably being very controlling and maybe even bigoted and hateful of my way of life and the way I think. So truth is something that is just out there and is unattainable. So Pilate's question, what is truth, is not something that's new. It's something that we've been dealing with a long time. And if you've been familiar with this series, you've, you've heard the term apologetics. Apologetics means defense. Christian apologetics means defense of the Christian faith. And so a lot of the focus of Christian apologetics gets to this question, what is truth? And so the defense of the Christian faith is to say that Christianity is true, that here's the evidence that Christianity is true, that the Bible is true, the claims in the Bible are true, and those are all valid pursuits. We want to understand that the Bible is true, that God is true, etc. But what you've also heard me say is that while that pursuit is absolutely vital and important, what I want to do in this series is focus more on the idea of relationship. So in this case, I want to take us to a place of relational apologetics, which doesn't just deal with the idea of what is truth. It, it, that's part of it. It's a vital part, but it's not the part that we deal with exclusively when it comes to the idea of relationship. Is what is truth, as Pilate says, is that the fundamental question when it comes to Approaching God, defending God, having confidence in who God is, etc. Is that the fundamental question? So to, so to talk about that, I want to take us through a little bit of an exercise. Here's a photo of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France. Now, unless you have been there or have some ties to Paris, France, it probably does not make a whole lot of difference in your life personally that it is true, it's a truth, that Paris, France exists. It doesn't really make a whole lot of difference to you. It may be true, but it doesn't make a difference. You know, you probably learned about Paris in school growing up. 
You've seen photos like this, movies, you've read books. If somebody handed you a free plane ticket, you might, you know, get on board and and take a trip to Paris, France, based on the idea that it's probably true that Paris, France exists. But what real personal difference does that make in your life, that something exists? And while it's a hard question, I would say in isolation, I could spend a whole lot of time proving to you that God exists, that Jesus was really here on earth and he really did the things he did, he really said the things he said, etc. But in isolation, proving that truth to you may not make a whole lot of difference in your life if that's all I'm doing. But think about this. Think about a person or people in your life that have made a real difference. People that you've been able to depend upon. People that have been there when you've needed them. People that will make a statement and it actually turns out to be true. People that will make a promise and will come through on that promise. Think about those types of people. People that you can depend on. People that are there for you. People that are consistent and have integrity. People that when you jump, you trust absolutely that they will catch you. So what's the most fundamental question? What is truth? Or who is true? It's a photo of Jesus pulling Peter out of the the abyss. What is truth? Or who is true? Truth matters. Our study of truth our defense of truth when it comes to Scripture, the claims of God, the existence of God, absolutely matters. But who is true to you, relationally, I would say matters even more. Right? The deepest need of the human heart is personal relationship. So isn't the, 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 the most fundamental defense that we can make of the truth Not just that the Bible is true, that God is true, those are important, but that God is true to you. God is true to you. Hebrews 11. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must, one, believe that he exists, it's important, but also that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So we have to believe that he exists, otherwise it's a fruitless exercise. But if I just believe that God exists, it makes no more difference to me in my life than the fact that Paris, France exists, where I've never been or, or have no ties to. I also have to believe that God is true to me. In in, in the way it's it's said here is he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That there is a quality in God's character that is truly relational. That when I seek him in relationship, he will reward me. He will catch me when I jump. He will be there when I need him. He will answer me when he promises. Right? It can't just be that the Bible is true, that God exists. It has to be something else. There has to be something about his character that is true. We have to have both. So we definitely need to know the authenticity of biblical claims and that a God exists for a truth. But the goal for knowing those claims are truthful is so that we might belong to the one who is true. So I'm not speaking to the exclusion of everything that you've ever learned about studying Scripture and defending the faith in the way that you've learned it. All I'm saying is, foundationally, I have to know for a fact that God is true 
and that I have a true relationship with him, but he also is true to me, relationally, in the same way that some of your best personal relationships are true to you. Relationship has to be the objective and the goal. A true relationship has many of the following qualities. And think about this in some of your truest relationships. It has a strong foundation, right? The closest friendships, the closest ties you have with husband, wife, family, kids, etc. It has a strong foundation. It has integrity, right? There's a bond. It's not chaotic, right? Like an, an explosion. There's something solid to your relationship. It has integrity. That makes it true. It has accountability. It has honesty. Can't have a true relationship without mutual honesty. It has openness. It has trust. So obviously, as I'm going through this list, consider, do I have a relationship with God that that contains these qualities? Do I have a strong foundation? Does God have integrity? Is he accountable? Is there honesty? Is there openness? Is there trust? Predictability. I need to have relationships in my life where there's some level of consistency and predictability. Otherwise, it's not really true, is it? Presence. My relationships aren't true unless the person shows up and I show up for them. Promises kept. Do they say what they mean and mean what they say? Do they say they're showing up at 3 o'clock at the corner of 5th and Vine and actually show up? (laughs) Unity. Fulfillment. Am I offering something in a relationship? Are they offering something to me? Communication. We're going to be getting into communication a lot next week when we talk about the Word of God. Again, are these qualities that God demonstrates, are these qualities that God demonstrates to me? Consideration. Patience. Forgiveness. Commitment. My my relationships are not going to be true without commitment. Faithfulness. Perseverance. You see what I'm talking about? Truth. We use truth as something that reflects reality. It's something true. That's part of it. But for our relationship to be true, it has to have these qualities and probably other qualities. God is true. The Word of God isn't just true or truth, but God himself is true. Numbers 23, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said it, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? Psalm 111, the works of his hands and truth are truth and justice. All his precepts are sure. You can count on them. They are upheld forever and ever. They are performed in truth and uprightness. Malachi 3, I, the Lord, do not change. Right? He's consistent. You can count on him, his character. Genesis 28, he's speaking to Jacob. He says, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. That's somebody whose character is true. The relationship with Jacob is true. He's a God who keeps his promises. 1 John 5, this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If I'm in a relationship and the person does not hear me, does not listen, is that really a true relationship? God hears us. He listens. Sorry. If we are faithless, 2 Timothy, he remains faithful. 
for he cannot deny himself. His character is not this explosion of inconsistency. He's true. And one thing I would say about this as far as defending the faith to ourselves and defending the faith to others, sharing Christ with others, is the best context for us to focus on the truth of God, whether God is actually true in character or true to us, is very often our own relationships and ourselves, (laughs) right? If we are faithless, he remains faithful. The contrast is, is pretty stark for me on a daily basis sometimes. I am not faithful to God. I am not true to others in a relationship very often. And I feel that pain. <laughs> I feel that inconsistency. But the argument is, you have all these relationships that are true. But even those relationships that are true, they aren't perfect, right? Even in your truest relationships, we are still false to each other. We are still unfaithful. We are still inconsistent. We don't keep our promises. We hurt each other. So is it possible that what is downstream is not as polluted as the source? (laughs) That the source of relationship, God himself, is true. That there is a God out there who is true. So it's important to Look at these scriptures in the context of our human relationships and our own character. Lamentations 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Do you hear it? I have a true relationship with him. I can count on him. Great is his faithfulness. We use this this in song and other things so many times. I mean, I don't know that there's too many scriptures that I rely on more than this one. And see, I I will tell you, even this morning, I was like, your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And that was in the context of my lack of faithfulness. (laughs) God is true. Jesus is true. God in the flesh. Jesus is true. John 7. The one who speaks on his own authority, Jesus is saying, seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true. And in him there is no falsehood. So all the stuff that we just saw... All all the truth of God has been attested to in the person of Jesus, right? He's saying, the one who seeks the glory of him who who sent him is true. So God is true. God sent me. I'm here to glorify God. So I'm true too. In me there is no falsehood, Jesus says. Truly I say to you, Matthew 5, Until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota nor a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Jesus said it. He did it. Under (laughs) pretty challenging circumstances, I would say. You can take the words of Jesus to the bank. Acts 17, we saw this several weeks ago where Paul is preaching to the men in Athens, he said, God has given assurance to all by raising Jesus from the dead. So this gets to the question of how can I know, right? In apologetics, we say, what's your proof? How can I be sure that what you're saying is true? So relationally, how can I know? God is true. Jesus is true. Well, one of the chief evidences... Of, of the truth, uh, the true character of Jesus and God is that God raised him from the dead. So all the promises that we see in Scripture prior to this, all the prophecies, everything that God said was absolutely dependent on the fact that Jesus 
would be risen from the dead. If he, if he did not rise, then much of what, maybe all of what God had said up to that point <clears throat> wouldn't matter. But by raising Jesus from the dead, there is proof. How do I know? Well, there were witnesses. We see it in the historical record. That's one way, and that's, that's classical apologetics. We look at that, right? How do we know that there was actually a Jesus, that he actually rose from the dead? Well, there were witnesses. In the same way that we attest to truth in the court of law, there were witnesses, and there was, a, there, was a, there was a constant stream of evidence that led through history. But it goes beyond that, right? Because truth isn't just, again, like Paris, France. What difference does it make? The fact was, is that the line of truth wasn't just what was real or what existed. It was, how did the truth of Jesus' resurrection affect the lives of those who came after? And so for 2,000 plus years, thousands, millions of people, their lives have been transformed. They have become true as a result of the living word of God rising from the dead, and existing now, but also rewarding those who earnestly seek him. The spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So again, we're kind of back in the court of law, right? A witness is a, is a, is a testimony to the truth of a fact, but also to the truth of the character of somebody else. So, We wonder, how can I know that God is true to me? The Holy Spirit is a person in the Godhead who testifies, is a witness to the truth of Jesus. That not only did Jesus exist, but that he is true. So as as Christians, we need the Holy Spirit in order to have that assurance. And we're going to get more into that next week. So we need to know that God exists. We need to follow the idea of, relation, uh, of, of classical apologetics. If you haven't done so, there are lots of great books. We looked at Josh McDowell. Lots of great men and women have looked at the, the evidences for God's existence, the, the evidence that points us to the fact that God, what God says is true, that the biblical claims are true, etc. But we also need to know that God rewards those who earnestly seek him, that God is relationally true. So many of us are searching for truth, but more people search for relationships that are true. Think about it. You meet lots of people who say, I'm, I'm on a search for truth, but the scope of their lives demonstrates much more of a search for relationships that are true. So we need to ask some questions. Is there a God out there who won't ever leave me or forsake me? And again, like I said, there's a bunch of people in the room, including myself, who have spent years in church, years in Christianity, but don't truly live in personal relationship in the way that they could. It's become more of a billboard than a conviction. Is there a God out there who won't ever leave me or forsake me? I'll admit, there are times I have told other people that where I really didn't believe it myself. So it's an important question. Is there a God out there who's someone I can turn to when the rest of the world seems to have abandoned me? Is God true? Is there a God whose character is full of integrity, who promises and delivers Do I just know that intellectually, or can I speak about that from experience? Does he promise and deliver? Is there a God in whom I can place my trust? Again, is this head knowledge? Are we going through the motions? Are we saying this just because we're supposed to say it as Christians? Or do we really believe it into our bones? Do I really trust him? Is there a God who communicates his heart to me and wants me to communicate my heart to him. Next week, we're going to be talking about the word of God. And you can make an argument otherwise, but I would say that perhaps the most practical and intimate way that we connect with each other is through mutual knowledge, mutual truth, that usually is exchanged 
through words. The Word of God is ultimately relational. And that's through the Holy, power of the Holy Spirit, the way that you and I can come to a, a true, practical, experiential conviction that not only is God, the, the claims of God true, but God himself is true. We'll end with John 17. Jesus is praying for his disciples to the Father, and he says, Sanctify them in the truth. The word sanctify simply means holy, to set them apart. Set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so have I sent them into the world. And for their sake, I concentrate, consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in the truth. You hear the relationship here, I hope. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Again, a relational apologetic. He's not just talking about the truth, that what I say is true. He's speaking about an objective where we are one with Jesus and the Father in the same way that Jesus and the Father are one. But you can see the interplay, the necessity of the word, of sanctification, of truth. The truth that's spoken of here isn't just facts and intellect. It's relational truth, right? It's being real with God and having God be real with you. So we're going to pray. And I just want to give you an idea that if you're someone that has studied the Word of God for many years, like I have, or have read the Bible, that our need for true relationship is about reading, understanding, reflecting upon God's Word. But God's Word is a means to an end. It's of the highest value of all the words that have been spoken in history. But the objective of the truth of God's Word is so that we might belong to the one who is true. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're humbled and thankful for your character and that not only do you have a character that is true, but that you have committed yourself to your creation and to your people that you have revealed your truth through your spirit, through the scriptures, through the person of Jesus Christ, and through the people that you have enabled and empowered to be transformed by your truth to become true people, people that keep their promises, people that can commit and be faithful people that can live lives of stability. And Lord, we know that we can only do any of this for any length of time with any level of authenticity because you empower us to do so. I thank you for your truth. I thank you that you are true. And I praise you for who you are and that you will never leave us or forsake us. In the name of Jesus, amen. This podcast is produced by Embrace What Matters Ministries and is available most anywhere podcasts can be found. I encourage you to subscribe, share, and please leave a comment or send me an email. To learn more about this ministry, my devotional book, and other writings, please visit EmbraceWhatMatters.com.